Okay. Didn't even take five seconds. Christy, I think we're streaming, right? It, it always takes a little for my, for my Does link it? to catch okay. up. Okay, yeah. so maybe I hit it first. So yeah, I think we're good. All right. So, so uh, Scott, I'll tell you what, let's do this, Scott. I just want you to introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, and then we'll just jump right into, uh, into our conversation. Yep, sounds great. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Scott Bono. I lead the global talent attraction and HR analytics teams at Indeed. So I'm responsible for the teams that support all of Indeed's internal hiring globally, um, as well as our people analytics and all of the data that underpins uh, our people and, and how we work and using that to help business leaders make great decisions. Just what, when you say attraction, that's an interesting term. I don't hear that too often. Is that part of the exact title, attraction? It is, yeah, and yeah. I think you know we, you will often hear it uh, framed in the industry as talent acquisition, which is also yes. a perfectly fine title. But um, actually, prior to my time stepping into this role about four years ago, uh, talent attraction was the title that Indeed had settled on, and I actually really like that because I think it is a little bit more of a people-centered way of framing it. I think we are not trying to acquire people; we're trying to create an environment where people are going to naturally be attracted, and then um, you know bring them into the fold. And I think. With our mission, you know, to be with, with our mission, which is to help people get jobs, I think it's it's a very naturally attractive thing, and it's, it fits with our overall approach to people strategy. You know, I like it because attraction. Yeah, you you want to attract a candidate, you want to attract someone to come there, you want to be attractive to a candidate. That's right. Whereas talent acquisition, it has like mergers and acquisition. It's kind of very corporate right? It's a very... little bit more clinical, I think, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we definitely do uh, like this the the, the people oriented, the sort of human centric approach. What's interesting too, but you didn't start out in HR, right? You're an engineer. So like what, a software developer or what? What did you yeah, do? That, yeah, that's right. So yeah, my degree, uh, my undergrad degree is in computer science. And I spent the first almost 20 years of my career uh, on the software engineering side of things. I started out as an individual contributor engineer. I kind of became a manager by accident um, in the mid 2000s. I was working at Google and they were going through a very significant growth phase. Um, and they were adding a, a, a layer of management. And I, I sort of fell into that job there. And through a series of you know happy accidents over a period of time, I found my way into larger and larger leadership roles. And then it was about four years ago, actually, that I moved, I made the move from engineering into HR formally. And then about three and a half years ago that I stepped into my current role leading uh, talent attraction at Indeed. To me, from the outside, that seems like a big change. You know, you don't see that too often. What made you decide to go from being an engineer? And when you say engineer, I imagine what you're doing coding, you're doing programming. Yeah, that's right. That. Yeah, I was a software engineer and, uh, and I, you're, you're right, I think it's not a super common move, I think, for people to move from engineering into HR. But for me, it was actually quite a natural one. There have been a couple of things that have been constants throughout my career. One is I was very lucky early on in my career to have uh, great managers who invested in me and, and made it their priority to find ways for me to be successful. And I've always appreciated that. And it's something that I have really tried to pay forward over the course of my career. And... Interestingly, as uh, as the roles that I sort of stepped into grew over time, there uh, I, be I became more and more interested in in the people side of the problem. There, there's sort of an old adage in the engineering world where when you first start your job, you've you know you're maybe you're fresh out of school or boot camp or something like that. You know a bunch of programming languages, so everything looks like a language problem. And then you get a little bit further in your career and you start to learn about frameworks. So then everything looks like it's a frameworks problem. And then you start to learn about architecture and then everything looks like an architecture problem. And then eventually you realize that everything is a people problem. And you know I hit that point uh, probably 15 years ago in my career where I realized everything was a people problem. And the the uh, world of HR is really just about how do you create you know, a successful environment for people to be able to do their thing. And it's been really fun to make that shift specifically at Indeed because we are an HR technology company. I don't know that I would have taken this role at a law firm or, you know, a construction right. company, but at Indeed, it makes a lot of sense. That's what, and, and, and imagine in a way, it's, it's using both your right brain and left brain, because I imagine, you know, one is very kind of analytical at times. And then with, you, you know, human resources, you have to have kind of that emotional, empathetic kind of piece too. So I wonder if that just makes you more of a holistic person, you know, that you have the ability to kind of use all your skills instead of just, you know, kind of being one direction. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I do enjoy the fact that my job allows me to both engage with sort of analytical and critical thinking and also, you know, work directly with and, and through people. And I think th there's a tendency maybe I've seen, you know, over my time in the industry to kind of think of engineers as a little bit more like automatons, like they're the people that you put <laughs> in the room. And <laughs> I, I didn't say that engineer, so don't, I can, don't I give can, me that. I can say it. I can say it because <laughs> right. I'm from that group. But, you know, they're the people that you put in a room, you know, give them a stream of caffeine and then out comes yeah. the internet, right? Um, but, but it, we we really are people too, and we want to have environments where we get excited, um, and and where we can feel productive and engaged, and and it's been it's been really fun to be able to kind of work on on both sides of things and to sort of see the world of what it what it looks like to try to build and 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 uh, help run a successful growing global organization both from the lens of, lens of product and technology as well as from the lens of people. Now, for what you're doing, you're kind of in that, you know, that, that seat where you can get a sense of like what's happening in the job market across the board, because, you know, indeed, just so ginormous. Are you seeing any trends lately? Like what sectors are hot? What sectors aren't hot? Now that it feels like the pandemic is waning, I don't want to kind of jinx it, but it seems like we're getting out of it. And you're starting to hear Google and Microsoft, hey, you were coming back to the office. Like what's going to happen in remote work or it's going to be hybrid work kind of any sense of like the future of work, like for people who watch it now who are thinking, because this is what's, I, I don't know, Scott, if you, if you feel this or you hear this from the people in your company or, or your customers, but I hear this every day when I'm interviewing people, they've kind of the pandemic made them rethink their whole life and what they want to do. And, you know, you talk about the great resignation, but a lot of people who are saying, Hey, I just don't want to be like, I don't know, a tax accountant for the next 10 years. I liked it, but I want it like you. You say, hey, I want to try something different now. Life is short. So for people who are watching this, who are thinking, hey, I want to pivot. I want to reinvent themselves. Do you have any color or texture? Like, hey, what's, what's hot? What's good? What's interesting? What's growing? Where you personally see the future of work going? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think from my seat leading talent attraction for Indeed. So I, my, my job is a little bit less about what is happening in the broader you know, uh, jobs market in, in, right. in globally, although I have, you know, some insight into that. Uh, but just looking through the lens of what Indeed's trying to do from a hiring standpoint, and we are hiring essentially for all roles at all levels in every location where we are around the world. So we, we have a pretty good cross section of a number of, of types of roles in a number of types of places. And the big thing that I think is a constant running through the job market right now is this, this, desire and and you may even say demand from from the job seeker side of the market for better increased flexibility and better work life balance or work life integration and i think we are certainly seeing signs of what you described in there in terms of people rethinking the role that work is going to play in their lives and one of the things that i think has been really interesting is that as we have been in this sort of forced social experiment over the last you know couple of years where lots of businesses had to find ways to get their work done in a dramatically different way than they were you know than they were used to people know now job seekers and, and workers know that you can do a significant number of jobs that used to maybe require you to be in an office five days a week you can do those successfully and productively and provably remotely and i just don't think we are all going to get collective amnesia about the fact that the last two years happened and so i expect that those employers and those companies that embrace uh, an approach to work that really puts the employee and the job seeker in the center of it and works on flexibility and better work-life integration, those are going to be the employers that really are able to thrive as we hopefully get to the other side of the current stage of the pandemic. So, so it's interesting because, you know, this cynical New Yorker in me sometimes feels that you know, what, let's say once we're out of it, you can start maybe seeing companies saying, okay, the two years didn't exist. Let's go <laughs> get back in the office five days a week, you know, everything. So back my mind to worry about, but, but then I do kind of also simultaneously feel the same way you are. You can't pretend those two years didn't happen. You can't pretend that people were successful. If you think about it, look at the stock market, except for like what's happened recently with a bit of a sell-off, but up until recently, record high. So it showed when people work remotely, it worked. I mean, it's you can't deny it. The productivity was off the charts. Stock prices out of control. It's probably too high. So 
I guess, right? Why go, like why? But the other thing is you can never underestimate senior executives screwing things up when they don't have to, like, cause it's, it's working. So maybe I'm hoping that they'll let it go. Do you, well, do you see, yeah. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there are some yeah. companies that try to move back to, mm -hmm. to a, more of a, of, a, of a five day a week in the office uh, type of model. Yeah. But there are lots of companies that aren't going to do that. And I, and I think it's gonna be difficult to attract and retain talent where, where others are offering similar kinds of opportunities, but with more flexibility. So that, that I think it would, it would require a lot of, of the big employers to sort of collectively all make that decision to really push the market back in the other direction, which just seems, seems unlikely. That makes sense because like, so if company A says, all right, I want everybody back in five days a week, that's it. Then people work. And if other companies say, no, nah, you could be flexible, you could be hybrid, you could be a digital nomad, you could do, do, you know, work where, when, how you want. So yeah, so then you have that's options right. and you're just gonna go over there. So I could see that, you know, and then some might just want to be five days a week in there, which is fine too. They may yeah. say, hey, you know what? I want to get the heck, after two years of being home, I want to get the heck out of my house. I don't mind being here five days a week. You know, it's probably more relaxing than being at home after for some people. I think, I think that's right. And, and you know, one of the things that we have definitely seen, at, you know, over the course of the last two years is that not everybody does have the kind of situation where it makes sense and it is comfortable or effective for them to work from home. I don't think that, that offices are going away by any stretch of the imagination. But to your point, it's going to be there for people to use it who choose to use it in the way that that makes the most sense for them. And I really feel like that hybrid model is is going to be the prevailing one over the, you know, that, that, that emerges as we, you know, hopefully get to the other side of the current pandemic situation. You know, it seems, you know, whenever I kind of look at the job market or talk to folks, tech seems to always stand out. It is, is it really like that tech? It's almost like barbells, what I've noticed. And I'd be curious about the data that you might have is that it almost seems to me just anecdotally without having, you know, any, any numbers, that it's almost like barbells on one side, like, you know, anything tech is super hot and it's hard to find people. And, you know, the tech talent want to get paid a lot because they're in demand, but then also kind of the frontline workers, you know, they're the ones who keep jumping around and it's hard to get them. You go to a restaurant and not enough servers, you know, warehouses, not enough people. Is it those bookends or are there other areas too that are, that are very hot, but just not as well covered in the press? It's a good question. I don't have specific yeah. data about that, so I wouldn't want to necessarily speculate. But one okay. thing that I, I do know is that we have seen that part of, you, you referred to it earlier as the, the great resignation. We've talked a little bit about it at, at Indeed as this idea of a great realization. And, and you touched on it as well, where the realization is that people are, are aware, of, more I think acutely aware of the role that work plays in their lives. And because of a lot of the circumstances of the pandemic, obviously the pandemic on its own, but also the way that the pandemic has changed the world of work has caused them to rethink the role that work will play in their lives. And, and what I mean by that is, if you are a, a, a worker or a job seeker who lives in the middle of a, a big urban city, New York, for example, and um, you know maybe you don't have access, ready access to transportation, and so you might have in the past limited your job search to you know twenty blocks in either direction from from where you live, where you could reasonably get to uh, you know on a daily basis. With so many more roles offering remote work or work on your own time, those kinds of things. The universe of job opportunities that are available to job seekers and the access that they have to, to those opportunities now is dramatically larger than it was before the pandemic. And so there have been certain industries where we have seen what looks like permanent departures of workers from things like um, food service, hospitality, and, and roles like that into other parts of the of the, the the labor market and my my speculation is that that is driven at least in part by the fact that there are so many more roles that are now accessible to people that aren't uh that don't depend on where you happen to be geographically that don't depend on your access to trans transportation and the like see to me that's one of this is i don't know if this is going to come across tone deaf but one of the positive things from the pandemic is just what you're talking about that great realization where people have said hey I don't have to work for a bad boss. I don't have to work for a micromanager. Um, I don't have to suffer indignities and rudeness. I'm going to go and do something else. I'm going to reinvent myself. I'm going to try something new. I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to be up. I'm going to try to upskill myself. And I think that's a really positive change 
in the mindset of people. Um, also, like I find out now, I don't know if you have any of the statistics or just see anecdotally on your site, where when I started recruiting, you know, 25 years ago, if I sent a resume to a person and to a hiring manager, it was only one year, they were like, Jack, what are you doing? Now it's common, you know, hey, did one year, did a tour of duty, and now I'm going to move on. So, so many things have changed now, but I think it changed in a positive way for workers where they have more options and it's more open for them. Did you, do you notice that on your site where, you know, whether the job listings or how people reply, uh, apply that you see people take jobs more frequently, move jobs more frequently, change careers more frequently? I think we have seen that. I've certainly seen that in in my own work, uh, and and you know, with the candidates that we see at Indeed. One of the things that there is quite a bit of discussion about, I think, in the industry more broadly, is how should you look at someone who has jumped around, you know, changed jobs, say, you know, every year or something like mm -hmm. that. There, I think, there has been a stigma in the past about that that you don't necessarily want to invest in in people who have a who have a history of staying at jobs for a relatively short period of time for fear that that you know that might suggest that they that they might not uh, stick around for a while at, at your company or or those folks that may have had gaps in employment and but I do really think that there is a shift that's happening right now uh, across at least parts of the industry where employers are are turning away from that just not looking and considering that data whether it's gaps in employment or relatively short stints and I think part of it is uh, you know sort of what you're describing there is lots of opportunity for people out there now that looks different than it had looked before uh, and you know I think there's also there is also um, the element of you, you just don't know you can't make assumptions about what someone's work life was like because you mentioned they may have had a terrible boss or they may have had a change in family or life circumstance mm -hmm. that led to that that move and so one of the things that we certainly emphasize at Indeed and we encourage employers to do is, you know, not not look at the, the piece of paper, but look at the person behind them and, and try to understand whether or not they're going to be a good fit for what you are trying to do in your company, in your organization, and to kind of move away from those, you know, maybe, you know, easily quantifiable things like mm -hmm. how long has someone stayed at a job or a gap that they've had in employment and, and really look at, at the, really the qualitative aspects of, of the person. This might not be your job, but to people indeed, when you have customer clients who are posting their jobs, do you give sometimes advice, like that kind of advice to them say, hey, wait a minute, you're saying that it's hard. I'm just making up an example here. Hey, it's hard for you to find you know, people, then you know, maybe kind of the account executives or what have you at indeed might say what you're saying. Wait, hey, don't discount a person because maybe they had a gap. Don't discount them because they were unemployed for a certain amount of time or they had to take care of sick relatives or what have you to kind of share that knowledge. So they're not having that pre-COVID mindset of like, nope, yep, gap, something's wrong. We're not going to hire this person. Or, you know, they haven't, you know, they job switched too much. We're not, we're not going to hire them. Does that go on? You know, it's a good question. I actually don't know specifically yeah. the answer to that question. But one thing I can say is that one of the things that we have tried to do at Indeed and, and one of the ways that we have pivoted our own product and technology strategy over the course of the last two years is to make the process of recruiting and identifying and selecting candidates for employers to be as low cost from an administration and sort of head uh, um, uh, overhead standpoint and allow them to really focus on those interactions with people. So uh, we built a product called the Indeed Hiring Platform and, and Indeed Interview over the last two years, which is really focused on making it easy for both job seekers and employers to get into a face-to-face -face conversation just like this using you know readily available technology. Basically, anybody who's got you know a phone or a laptop and access to the internet can jump in. And from a job from a from a an employer standpoint one of the things that we have focused a lot on there is automating the process of getting into a conversation with the candidate. So using things like Indeed's resume database to help identify people who might be really good candidates, taking care of all the interview scheduling so that as a hiring manager, you just show up and there's a queue of candidates waiting there for you. You can take 15, 20, 30 minutes with each one of them. And I think that kind of technology can help uh, help employers move beyond that. Well, do I really want to spend time talking to this person? I've got a giant stack of resumes. No, you just show up for a couple of hours, talk to a bunch of different people, get to know them, you know, on a direct basis, and then use that part, you know, use that 
as a, the opportunity for you to assess and see whether or not they're going to be a good fit. And those types of things, I think, bring lots of benefits both to employers in terms of productivity and cost savings and the like, but they also help job seekers who may uh, you know, may get lost in the shuffle or, or may mm -hmm. not necessarily stand out in, um, you know, from someone just taking a quick glance at their resume. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it seems like you have those systems. It makes it so easy. But then I always hear from candidates that they have such, not, not with Indeed, just in general, you know, where you have to do five, six, seven, ten interviews over time. You get ghosted. You don't get feedback. Um, do you think eventually that's going to go away where, Maybe that's, I don't want to go off on a limb here, but maybe part of it is like, it's no secret as a society, at least here in America, we've been just at each other's throats for the last bunch of years. Everyone is angry, anxious, stressed. And maybe in a way, that's why there's more ghosting, lack of feedback. Do you think like in the looking forward, when hopefully we get out of this period and we're getting our minds back together, our health back, mental health back together, that maybe it won't be as bad because we'll be a little bit more empathetic, we'll be you know, hopefully this war doesn't go with World War III. Let's assume that's off the table. Do you think that might change and you won't have as many complaints about, and again, not from you guys, but just generally speaking, complaints about ghosting, lack of feedback, too many interviews, that kind of stuff? I, I hope so. And what you're talking about, I think, particularly from the job seeker or candidate lens is really the, the, the lack of investment that I think we have we, the, the jobs industry, the, the labor market, have historically maybe made in terms of the can't, focusing on the candidate experience. So if you view, if you're a hiring manager or an organization trying to hire people and you view the entire recruiting process as simply you you know, picking out avocados at the grocery store, you know, like just, I'm just trying to figure out which one's the right one for me. And once I got that, I'm headed directly to the checkout. And you don't think about the experience of the candidate on the other side of that, there, that what we're seeing now in the market is candidates realizing that that they there are better options out there, and in a market like we see right now, where it's very clearly a job seekers market, those that have a terrible candidate experience, those where the interview process is long and drawn out, those that that make candidates feel like the the employer isn't valuing their time. People are going to vote with their feet, and there is a little bit of, I think, of, of a Darwinian process that that will go on there. But I do think that there is a, an increasing movement uh, or understanding in the hiring community of the importance of focusing on the employer brand and, and candidate experience. Uh, this is why I think sites like uh, Glassdoor and the uh, the um, Indeed company pages, where both job seekers and employees can can go and post real reviews about their experiences interacting with the company. There's a very significant fraction of job seekers. I don't have the statistic off the top of my head who consult review sites for for uh, the companies that they are interviewing with before they even talk to a hiring manager. And so there's a there's a really valuable feedback channel, I think, for employer from for employers to use tools like Glassdoor and indeed company pages to understand how both current and past employees uh, feel about their companies and then use that as a feedback loop to help introspect and find ways to improve. You know, it's so interesting with, as you mentioned, with Glassdoor and other sites where you can kind of your site, indeed, where you can kind of measure it. Yeah, people look to see what's happening. But then also with social media, what was like that better.com guy who laid off over a video, you know, 900, whatever, 900 people or something crazy like that. And it's such, it's so bad for the brand. And as you were saying, and it's interesting you brought that up because in a lot of my writings for Forbes, where I'm speaking to different chief people officers and you know, executives, they're now kind of branding, not just the company. Like usually you hear brand, you think of, okay, it's Coca-Cola, here's our brand. But now they're branding the whole onboarding, the whole recruiting, the whole interview process, the whole, here's who we are as a company, not necessarily what we're, we're selling, the product we're selling, but us and how, why you should join us, which is kind of a different thing that I haven't seen before, but it makes sense. You know, you will be, especially, I don't know if you, if, if you see this, but I, I, I see this a lot in which particularly let's say Gen Z's and maybe younger millennials, they're all about, hey, am I going to go work for a place that shares my values? Do they have the same core principles that I do? And if, and if they do, I'm kind of interested. And if I don't, thank you, but no, thank you. I'm going to go somewhere else. So it, I see so many different changes happening in the way people are looking at how they want to work, where they want to work, who they want to partner with. 
Yeah, I agree. And I do think just anecdotally, what, what we have seen or what I have seen is that the more recent generations that have entered the workplace do think more strongly about values alignment of their own personal values with those of the organizations that they choose to associate with in terms of in terms of working or, or supporting and promoting. And you're right. I think the, the power of social media is is it's a rising you know phenomenon in in the world of work and it does make things like focusing on employer brand very much maybe more relevant now than it had been you know 15 or 20 years ago for sure but one of the things i do want to touch on is the fact that while you can certainly focus on employer branding and, and most large employers do and and should continue to make investments in that space you have to make sure that what you are putting out in the market matches the experience that your employees are going to be talking about in whether it's on Glassdoor or if it's on, you know, Blind or Fishbowl or things like that as well, or if it's just straight up on Twitter, you know, or or Instagram. Uh, that there's a there is a, an increasing emphasis on I think from the especially from the younger uh, generations in the workforce on that authenticity it's really important they they will see through if you if you are projecting one thing as your brand but their experience is something different there's not a lot of uh, patience and tolerance for that uh, and and I think that's a good thing I think um, it's totally fine to have an aspirational view of what you're trying to be as a company as an, and, and as an employer. But if there is a wholesale mismatch between what you're projecting out there and what people are experiencing regularly, it's going to show up in places like social media. And, and uh, the feedback loop uh, is very tight now, whereas that may not have been the case in the past. Such an interesting point. It's it's because you do hear stories where a company portrays themselves as one thing and then you'll see online people say the exact opposite like what is this and it's a big risk and brought to mind you know i can't recall i think dan price is his name the guy from gravity we all see him on on uh, all the time on yeah. online talking about how he did everyone gets seventy thousand. that's his brand and it must work because you otherwise you would see people commenting you're full of it dan you know, I work there and it's horrible. You're a terrible person. So I guess that's an example. So we having a brand like, hey, I'm taking care of my employees. I'm going to do right by them. I'm going to, you know, bring down my salary, bring everyone's up. And he's been doing this now for several years. And I haven't seen one person kind of come out there and say, hey, this is not true. So, so it burnishes the brand. By not seeing that, you're like, oh, this guy's legit. This guy's the real deal. Whereas that's not the case with a lot of other companies. When you see how people, like, well, you see it firsthand when people talk about companies, like whether on Glassdoor or Indeed, what have you, they're very free. I don't know if you notice either people are very free to say, I hate this or I love it. There's not a lot of in between. So that, it's, that's it's sure. very stark, right? And, and it is, I, I think it's fair to say that there is a selection bias happening yeah. in those people who choose to take time to write reviews yes. on stuff on those sites. So you are going to tend to get polarized views, both people who are extremely happy and yes. people who have had, who have had very negative experiences. <laughs> so it is, it is important to take that into account, but I think your broader point is, is a really valid, valuable one, which is that that authenticity is, can be very powerful when, when you put it to the right use. One of the things that I love about Dan Price is that he also hasn't shied away from talking about some of the negative things that cropped up inside the company when the when they made those changes. And he, I think he's embraced a a very transparent public view of of his approach to organizing the company. And you know, to your point, he made that change several years ago now it was well before it's hard to, mm -hmm. pandemic time is a weird thing right <laughs> totally but, but, but it was definitely yeah. before the pandemic <laughs> yeah. um and and you know he's been very consistent in that and and i think there's a lesson to be learned in that i mean obviously that particular move might not be the right thing for everybody to do but i really appreciate the the authenticity and the transparency of the way that he has presented his decision making process and how it has played out over the last several years you know, another, I think another big thing is who you work for too. You know, you know, you, you could be at a great company and have a bad boss. You could work at a meh company, but have an awesome boss. And I think you, you've mentioned to me that you, you've had a good mentor, a good manager in the past, and that made a difference in your career. Is that, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that old adage of people join companies and quit bosses is, is true. It's certainly been my, true in, in, in my experience. And, 
Yeah, there's there's a um, a manager story that that I have I have held closely and shared lots of lots of times over the years. When I was I was working at Google in the mid two thousands, and it was actually shortly after I had moved into management for the first time. And I had a, a manager uh, who had been in the industry for a really long time. His name was Mark Donner, and he was just just a really genuine and authentic guy. And I remember in a one on one with him one day where I had shared that I was frustrated with myself because I had made a, a mistake and it had caused, you know, some issues in the, in the work that we were doing. And, um, I'm, I have a little bit of a perfectionist streak, so I'm, I tend to be pretty hard on, on myself. And Mark said to me, your job is not to not make mistakes. It's to always make new mistakes. And, and that has really stuck with me because it, it hit home a fundamental truth, which is that we're all people and people are going to make mistakes. Like that's part of being a person and, and growth comes on the other side of making mistakes and learning from them. But the sign of improvement is that you're not repeating your old mistakes. So that adage of always make new mistakes has been something that's really stuck with me and something that I have tried to convey to the folks that I've worked with and supported over the years as well. You know, it's, that's such an underrated thing, having kind of a manager who's, who cares, who's empathetic, who's encouraging. It makes all the difference in a career. And what, you know, part of what you're saying, and I hear this when I've interviewed a lot of these executives, is what they do is, and they, they, they of course, they have to have a cool term. They just can't say what it is. So it's more psychological safety. But I've heard, I never heard of that phrase until fairly recently. <clears throat> and then it got popped up with a bunch of these folks and where exactly your experience. So if someone made a mistake, you know, you have two kinds of bosses. One who's going to be like, how how'd you do that, Scott? What's wrong with you? Ah, this is terrible. And do it in front of everybody. And now it's, it's, it's horrible and you're embarrassed, you're uncomfortable and it's just, just a terrible situation. Or others were like, okay, Scott, that happens. You know, we all make mistakes, no worries. We'll figure it out. It's not the end of the world. Let's, let's you, know, you, know, you know, we could kind of improve it. And it makes such a difference in terms of the worker to say, <clears throat> wow, I really appreciate this. I messed up. And I know I did a dumb thing, like, you know, before I couldn't get on, I couldn't find my Zoom this morning and it happens, <laughs> and, you know, and everybody was understanding instead of saying, Jack, you're a moron. Like, how can, what do you, you do this all the time? But by, by not saying anything, like if you, you know, everyone said something, I'd be like, oh man, the whole thing, I would be a bad head. But no, you're like, hey, these stuff happen. Same thing, if it makes such a big difference in a career, if you have that boss. Now, how can you find that out though? Because that's a good question. Like that's an interesting part too. You generally don't hear specifics about a person. It is so important. It uh, you're 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 right. And and mm. the the it's hard. It's hard to really yeah. understand that. Because even in even in a, a company that may have a great reputation, you may wind up in a situation. Not everybody is great. Not every manager is good. And yeah. and you might wind up in a in a situation where the team that you're working for or you're being hired into, you know, doesn't necessarily have the best leader in it. And it's difficult to suss suss that out. For sure, but I do think at a high level, looking at things like reviews can give you some visibility into what the overall culture of the company is. But I also think that this is where, as a job seeker, you you have an opportunity to make use of the time in interviews. Certainly, most of the interviews that I've ever been a part of, and certainly all the interviews that I do, we always set aside you know five, 10, 15 minutes at the end of the interview for the candidate to ask questions. And for me personally, that's my favorite part of every interview. I actually often get better signal on on a person through the questions that they have for me than the questions that then I ask them because it gives you an opportunity to get a glimpse into how is this person thinking about their job search and what is important to them as they ask questions and so one of the things that I would certainly encourage job seekers to do is be thoughtful about the kind of things that you want to understand you know about what's working at a company one of the things that i have done a lot over the course of my career whenever i've interviewed for jobs is ask the same question of everybody that i talk to and see how consistent the answers are because if you ask a question about culture or about the day-to-day -day or something along those lines and you get vastly different answers from the people that you talk to versus if you get a very consistent set of answers that can give you some hint hints as to what the you know, what the day-to-day -day world might be for you if you had a job in that organization Jack, I've lost your audio. I'm not sure. So uh, they, um, so what happens is, uh, you know, you'll ask a part, you know, I'll ask you and then Jane, John, Sally, whatever, and you get different opinions. 
And then you're like, wait, do they even know what, what, what the culture is, <laughs> you know, what, you know, is expected? So that's kind of a warning sign. So to ask that question, especially nowadays where what I see, even for entry level, you're having two, three, four, five different interviews. So it's a good chance to feel it all out. What are some of the other kind of, I don't want to say hacks, but what are the other suggestions you would have for people who are seeking a job to kind of either ask or do in the interview process to stand out or even to get notice? Yeah, this is one of those things where I wish I could write a <laughs> listicle that was like five, top five it. best, you know, job <laughs> hacks. But, you know, I think it's the, 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 the truth is it's, it's extremely situational yes. for, you know, for people. But there are a few things that I think are really important. You know, when it comes to writing a resume, for example, particularly if you're going to be looking at a job that is, you know, in any way specifically outcome or data oriented, framing your experience around outcomes that you helped achieve, around metrics that you helped move, around those types of things that, that are going to impact the way that the, the, the hiring manager might think about, about things, um, that can be really valuable. I, I tell job seekers, go look at the job description that you're for the role that you're applying to, see what words they're using to describe the, the role, then go look at your resume and make sure you're using similar language in your, as you're describing your experiences. And it might be a little bit overkill, but in some cases, you might even wanna massage your resume in terms of how you how you frame your experience and the language that you use based on the specific role that you're applying to. Because it's just natural human behavior, right? If you are, if you are a hiring manager and you've described the role that, you, that you're looking for, then you look at a resume, you're gonna look for those same terms and those same kinds of uh, experiences described in a similar way. So being cognizant of the language that the job description uses, that, that, that you know, maybe you're, if you had an initial screen with a, in, uh, a recruiter or a hiring manager, and then making sure that you're using that same kind of terminology, as, as long as it makes sense, right? And this could just be simply, you know, what word do I use to describe, you know, my, my experience, in, you know, as an accountant or as an engineer or those kinds of things. Very simple things like that can, can help just align you in the minds of whether it's the recruiter or the hiring manager. But I wish there was a great, like one, you know, great tip to, to, to make sure that you stand out. But uh, unfortunately, it's, it's more complex than that. Yeah. To go back to the manager, it's interesting. This isn't going to happen, but it's just an interesting thought experiment. The same way, you know, uh, uh, interviewers kind of delving deep into a candidate and asking everything about it. it I wonder, would one day would we see the reverse where you're going to look for a job and then they'll show, hey, Jack Kelly is the manager and here's what Jack Kelly's about. You know, so before you go into an interview, not just a, like a LinkedIn profile, but more of a, all right, what am I going to get here when I go into it to learn more about the person that I'm going to look for? Um, I, do, do you think we may start seeing in the future, just if the market is going the way it is, a hot market, really tough to find talent, you know, employees have the upper hand, we're going to start seeing lots of different changes that are going to accommodate it, you know, the, the workers and the employees, because if they don't make these accommodations, they'll just leave and go somewhere else. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I think the, the closest analog that I can think to what you're describing right now would be something like rev the review sites that pop up for things like physicians and doctors, right? Where you're actually getting, you're getting that a patient's experience with a doctor. Um, and uh, that analogy, I think in, in that case, it works really well because you know, oftentimes you as a person are making a specific choice yeah. to work with a particular doctor or something like that. But uh, I, I, I have a hard time seeing how that might manifest itself inside of a inside of a company but i do think that employers are you know increasingly turning to hr analytics or people analytics to understand things like manager effectiveness and uh employee engagement and uh employee sentiment and those kinds of things and there are lots of ways to look at at that data and to measure those things internally that i i expect are going to that's going to be an area of of continued investment for people. And you were mentioning earlier about this emergence of this concept of psychological yeah, safety. Yeah. As far as I'm aware, th that, that, or the first place that I became aware of that was in a big study that Google did many years ago. It was actually, it was after I left, but they formed a group inside of their people operations organization with the goal of trying to understand what made certain teams particularly effective 
that set them apart from other teams that weren't. And it was this concept of psychological safety that was the primary discriminating factor. Those teams that felt a high degree of psychological safety were the most performing, and those that had a low degree of psychological safety tended to not perform as well. And I think that type of study is something that is extremely valuable. And there, there has been, subsequent to that, a significant amount of investment in, in that space. And I expect that we will see even more of that as we move into the future. So when you mentioned data analytics, it's, it's, it's so interesting because before the show, we were chatting a little bit. Uh, and I just wrote a piece about a DECO study that you know, not only do you, does the chief people officer have to do his or her job, but now you could be a data scientist too. And when they first approached me with it, I was like, that sounds like a lot. And it sounds like two completely different things. And I'm kind of Googling stuff, trying to figure it out because like I'm because <clears throat> I don't want to write something and everyone's gonna say, Jack, you're an idiot. What's like, no, that you're not making so, but I guess that's a thing, right? It, is that a new trend where they're really HR is gonna be heavily involved with data? And it is so, how does that work? Yeah, I, I do believe it is a trend. And yeah. whether or not the chief people officer needs to specifically have that skill, I think is is, is a question mark. But they, they should have yeah. a, a, an HR analytics organization led by someone who has a st very strong background in that space. And I do believe that that people cultures are going to evolve to much more deeply include data as as we move forward. And, you know, there there are lots of interesting examples of why this is important. And I can draw one from my own experience or uh, in the early days of the pandemic at Indeed. There was a question that came up about uh, how how are people utilizing our PTO program now compared to the same time last year, for instance, and this was maybe like. April, May, June of 2020. So we were really in the thick of lockdowns and we were all still figuring out what was what was going on. Right. And Indeed has an open PTO policy where the idea is you can decide how much time you need to take off, just work with your manager and, and utilize that time. But one of the things that we saw was really interesting. While everyone was working from home, we had made the shift from essentially having everybody in an office to everybody working from home. Almost a year ago today, it was March 6th, I believe, of 2020. Um, we were finding that people were taking significantly less time off than they had previously, while it was obvious that broadly everybody was under more stress than yeah. they were on previously. And, and we started to dig in to understand why might that be going on? And there were a variety of different reasons. People couldn't travel or do the things that they might normally do with respect to paid time off. But there was also an element of concern about well, we don't know what's going to happen with the economy, and I don't want to be the person who's taking time off when everybody else is working if we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so what we did in response to that understanding was focus our executive communication on the importance of time off, encourage people to take time off. We actually shared with the company the changes that we had seen in PTO utilization over the, you know, over the prior three months compared to where we had seen in the past. And uh, you know, our CEO and our other senior leaders in these company-wide all hands we have would start sharing their personal stories of the time that they took off. And that had a material impact. People started to feel comfortable with taking their time off. The reason I bring this up though is because we only discovered this because we were looking at data as mundane as where, you know, when and where are people taking time off and does that maybe indicate that there might be an issue that we can help address. Sounds great. And, and I imagine, do you, do you also look at is there a way to gauge if the employees, let's say it indeed, are getting burnt out, or their mental health issues, uh, feeling of isolation, depression? Because these are all hitting record highs throughout the pandemic. Yeah, and and there is uh, there is this notion of employee engagement surveys, which are pretty well understood, I think, mm -hmm. across across many industries, and they come in all shapes and sizes. But they're designed to really get a pulse of of where your employees are and sort of how they're feeling about their work environment, how they might be feeling about their manager or their function or their colleagues, those types of things. And again, just you know, our own experience at Indeed, we actually. Uh, we went and designed some surveys that were specifically focused on understanding the things that were relevant in the pandemic. How are you feeling about your ability to work from home? What resources do you feel like you might need? How are you feeling with respect to stress and, and burnout and those kinds of things? And obviously, the survey questions were worded better than the ones that I just made up here. But to your point, I think it's very important to, to, to touch base with people. Uh, and But one of the things I would point out is one of the things that we did run into was actually survey fatigue. People feeling like we're asking them too many questions about <laughs> too many things point. too frequently. Um, right. 
<laughs> but one of the things that 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 that, uh, that research has shown is that one of the primary determining factors of how employees view things like surveys is how confident they are that you're going to take action on what you tell them. Uh, interesting. So it's really important as a company if you're going to ask your employees how they feel about something to make sure that you have a follow up strategy where yeah. you are going to tell them, hey, we asked you this. These were the results and these are the actions that we're going to take. Even if the action is nothing, we're not going to do anything about this because it's very important to communicate that to employees so that they feel like you haven't wasted their time. And they and that gives them, I think, psychological safety and permission to then be more forthcoming and and uh, transparent with their own answers to you know questions or surveys that you may ask in the future. It's, that makes so much sense because I could I could foresee that I could see that if like oh, uh, another survey and especially if nothing's being done like well I gave you my opinions and you didn't do anything That's about right. it why well, give you another survey so and it goes back to what you're saying about branding that you have to if you're going to do something you have to hold it if you say here are our values you got to do it you say hey we're going to give a survey and we're going to listen to you and we're going to hear what you have to say and take action and if you don't then it's like I don't believe you anymore yeah. and you lose all that trust hey I I know oh I can't believe the time but I had two other questions to ask before we go. So I know you're a modest guy, and but do you want to share a little bit? Because you, you, your company is doing some really good work, and they're doing some work with goodwill in terms of helping people. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Would you? Yeah, I'm happy to. So uh, Indeed recently announced a program that we call uh, Essentials to Work, and it's really focused on helping job seekers with barriers get access to employment. And we are partnering with a number of folks, including Goodwill, Lyft, PCs for People, and the program is focused around, around, three, around three areas. Uh, one is technology. So this is things like uh, uh, getting internet access via mobile hotspots to job seekers, as well as things like laptops and phones with, uh, with customer support. We're partnering with PeoplePC to provide discounted mobile hotspots, hotspots and devices to income eligible uh, folks. Um, we're investing $5 million to provide 10,000 mobile hotspots to job seekers in the U.S. beginning in January of 2022. The second area that we're focused on is transportation. Uh, we're partnering with Lyft, uh, investing a million and a million uh, five, a million five hundred thousand dollars uh, with Lyft to offer rides through the Lyft Up program for job seekers who um, need access to, to internet or computer device pickup, job training programs, as well as transportation for the first three weeks on a new job. And then the last area is around uh, record uh, clearing for folks that have been justice impacted. So uh, Indeed is pledging $2.5 million to provide record clearing services to job seekers with criminal records who are eligible for expunction or non-disclosure orders. So we're partnering with uh, NELP to provide subgrants to nonprofit legal organizations to clear job re records for job seekers. And we are also working with Goodwill, uh, who will receive funds to provide record clearing services to the job seekers that they work with. And this is a part of our overall goal um, uh, between now and 2030 to help 30 million uh, job seekers with barriers find employment. So it's something that we're very proud of and, and very excited to be working with these yeah, partners it's, on. Yeah, it's such good work because just out of, it's pure coincidence, you know, I was speaking to Steve Preston, who's the CEO of Goodwill Industries, and, you know, talking, I, I to be fair, I, you know, I've heard of it. I, 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 was, I, before the conversation, I kind of thought it was kind of like, you know, Salvation Army kind of thing, just raising money. And then, you know, you see those thrift stores. I didn't mm -hmm. know they have a whole job training program. And That's it, right. There's a huge initiative for the, you know, to teach people to keep up with the digital change in this, you know, fast growing tech environment. And they cater to underserved people. Um, and those are the ones who could easily fall behind. So it goes from just teaching them, no exaggeration, how to get on a computer, how to get on Google, how to go to Facebook, because a lot of them, maybe they don't even have a high school degree. They, you know, they just, they, it, it's easy to get lost. So they're trying to kind of get them on that ramp to start learning these things and then go through these programs and be able to maybe code to do cybersecurity. And there's some really cool success stories. So by you partnering with them, it's great because they need the help. They need the internet connection. They need, they yeah. may not have the money to go back and forth. So they need the lift to take them. So it's it's really cool stuff. So it just it was it was so interesting when when the folks at Indeed said, "Hey, Chad, maybe bring that up." I'm like, "Oh yeah, let's for so you know the two separate say, yeah, let's talk about it because it's such a good cause and do such a good thing." Um, and the last question before you go, 
biggest question at all. Tell us about the guitars in the background. What's up? <laughs> what's going on? What do you... So clearly you're a musician. Any, anything we should know? I, I, I am a musician. I, I have been, um, I, I grew up and we were talking about this earlier. We're both huge fans of, of 90s grunge yeah. music. And, you know, I was, uh, my, I, the 90s for me was high school and college. So I yeah. started high school in 91 and graduated college in, in 99. Um, and, and yeah, I've been I've been playing in, in bands and things like that since I was 15 years old. And uh, I live in, in Austin, Texas, which we like to call ourselves the live music capital of the world. So there's a bunch of just really amazing musicians here in Austin. And in fact, Indeed has a, a bunch of really, really outstanding musicians every year prior to the pandemic at our, our holiday parties in Austin. Uh, rather than hiring out for entertainment, Indeed employees would be would be the entertainment we would form bands and that might seem a little cringeworthy like oh no what's this gonna no be like? it sounds but cool there, sounds there actually are some really amazing people there's a there's a, a funny story when i originally joined indeed I, I joined in june of 2016 and i had heard that there was a band that was getting ready to, to play the our holiday party which we had at the austin city limits M moody theater right where, oh, where nice. they tape austin city limits you know huge stage or what have you and i was like hey you know i i put my hand up and said you know i'm a guitar player i've been playing for a long time i'm really looking forward to is there any way that i can tr contribute to the show and they were like oh sorry we've already been rehearsing for you know for three months mm -hmm. or something like that they had started rehearsing in like march for a show in december um and and they take it really seriously i actually did manage to finagle my way into <laughs> into that show nice. and, I, and i did get to play and i've played every year since but yeah it's just really it's been really fun and yeah i've um those guitars are, are, you know, products of a misspent midlife, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your go-to grunge band? What would you, for people who aren't tuned in to grunge music, what, what would, what's like a easy to get into to just kind of understand, you know, who, who they may not know, especially let's say Gen Z's who have no idea what we're talking about. Well, so I think even Gen Z would probably be familiar with Dave Grohl. And I definitely have, <laughs> yes. have a, have a, uh, a man crush on, on Dave okay. Grohl. He, and, and so I'm, I'm definitely a huge Nirvana, Nirvana and Foo Fighters fan. Um, and, uh, and yeah, but I mean, I think there's a, that, that, that era, that music, there are folks like, like Dave Grohl and Nirvana, Chris Cornell and Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, those kinds of things are, are just absolutely some of my, my favorite music. And it's it's been really fun. It's been really fun over the last several years where the 90s is kind of having its resurgence now, where, you know, those of us that grew up with it are now in our 40s and have disposable yeah. income and, and are happy to go, you know, yeah. see 90s tribute nights yeah. at our local, our <clears throat> local uh, uh, bars and things like that. So it's been really fun. That's great. So that, that's awesome. <clears throat> it's great that you have all those different interests. Because I think that's also, you know, since we're talking career related, I think that's important too, that, you know, sometimes people in their career just get so tunnel vision, just focus on their job and career that they don't really have anything else. And then if, you know, God forbid they lose their job, then they lose all their identity. They have nothing else to fall by. So it's, it's good to be well-rounded, whether it's a musician or painting or whatever it is yeah. to have other things. And uh, yes, that's great. Any, any, before we leave, anything I didn't ask you that you feel would make sense to share with people? Or I know we covered a lot. But yeah, I, no, I, 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 I can't think of anything. It's been it's been a great, great conversation. Well, that, I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot. I think the people watching this now and then what we'll do is we'll clean it up, edit it, repost it, you know, again. So I think this is great for people. It gave a lot of advice, a lot of color, a lot of insight. And that's that's what we're trying to do with, with this podcast, really to help people. You know, it's 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 a good job market, but it's still not easy for people. And a lot of people aren't sure what to do. They don't know what questions to ask. So bringing on people like yourself who could kind of explain what it's all about, I think helps out a lot. So uh, so I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. And this was fantastic. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, for next, you know, for the next holiday party, I'll come down. I want to go to Austin. I hear it's great. You're, uh, we'll take you up on that offer for right. sure. I can't play any music, anything, but I'll that's, just be- that's not, just... that's not a requirement. You can, <laughs> okay. you can enjoy it. Perfect. Excellent. Well, Scott, it was great seeing you and I love what you're doing at Indeed. It's awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Jack, thanks for including me. I My really pleasure. appreciate it. It was fun. Bye-bye.